today is Carl Carter. Carl is a realtor. He's also the founder of the Beverly Carter Foundation, which is a nonprofit um, foundation dedicated to improving realtor safety and agent safety. Carl's mom, Beverly Carter, lost her life um, in 2014 at the hands of a couple that was posing as clients. Since his mom's passing, Carl has dedicated um, a tremendous amount of time and energy to spreading the message that it's important, it's critical that realtors pay attention to safety. And so he's here to share that message with us this morning. And I'd like to ask you all to please help me welcome Carl. And with that, we'll turn it over. Good morning, Carl. Thank you for coming and speaking with us today. Oh, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it is almost afternoon here, so I'm coming to you from the great state of Arkansas. So, uh, woo pig or big Arkansas, howdy to you. <laughs> Whatever makes you think of Arkansas. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. This is always the fun part of like holding your breath, making sure it's going to work. All right. Well, um, to me, this is my, my favorite part of the presentation because not only do I get to express my gratitude to you for these, this opportunity, but I also have um, the opportunity of introducing you to my sweet mom. Um, haven't given this presentation in a while, so forgive me if I get a little emotional. Um, that beautiful lady on the screen there is my mom. Um, she was a realtor here in the Little Rock, Arkansas area, and I, after losing her, I found myself uh, one of those people, and I know we all process grief differently, but I found myself just full of energy and anxiety, and I needed to put it to work, and so I'm, I'm thankful for, for the opportunity for this outlet because I do think that it, it is helpful. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity to speak, like, speak to leaders such as yourself, because if you, you all know this, if you do any studies on building the culture of an organization, and that can be from a number of things, right? From professionalism to safety, it, it really uh, starts at the top. So thank you, thank you. Um, one last thing before I start is that um, my mom would give me a big thump on the head from heaven if any of you were to walk away from this presentation with a, a spirit of fear, um, this, this truly is um, me telling a story that I personally feel is um, my mom's death was 100% preventable. And by we can take her story, we can learn from it, and we can make proactive, preventive steps to keep all of our agents safe. So uh, again, I thank you so much. To get started today, I'll tell you a bit about my mom just personally. Um, at the time she was taken from us, she was 50 years old. Uh, that picture on the left of her and my dad, um, that was from her uh, 50th birthday party. My mom was 50 when she was taken from us. And at that time, uh, she'd been married to my dad for almost 34 years. So if you do that math, you, you realize they were teenage sweethearts and got married at a very young age. You can see there in the middle, that is a picture of my mom um, and me from the early 80s. And I think we can all agree that every picture from the early 80s looks very similar to this. Um, I always joke that if it's possible to be, you know, upset or mad in heaven, that my mom is quite upset that I shared this picture of her pair of faucet hair <laughs> to anyone that'll look at it. Um, and then I, I must tell you all, especially those of you that that our grandparents, you will relate to this, that set wife aside, set realtor aside, set mom aside, her most uh, treasured role, her favorite hat she got to wear was being grandma to, um, to all the grandkids. I have three kids and um, it's very tough navigating life um, after something so public, so horrific happened, happened in our family, you know, as parents, I think that we think of worst case scenario, you know, that what we, you know, in protecting our kids, the fear that someone might take our child, and you don't think about the risk associated with your mom could be kidnapped, 
uh, like in my case, or you. And um, and so it's just, it's very hard to navigate life, um, trying to give my kids a, a balanced perspective of the, the wonderful woman that my mom was, the good that still exists in this world, and also acknowledging that there is evil among us. So as I begin today, and um, I, you know, it's so important for me to, to help you realize what all of us have in common, what my mom has in common with all of us, because I wholeheartedly believe that my mom was targeted for reasons that apply to every one of us, um, especially those of us that are actually in the business of real estate. And so to start, even from the bad guys themselves, so um, as Cindy was saying um, in the intro, it was a husband and a wife that did this to my mom. They perceived her to be rich. So whenever they were asked multiple times by news outlets, by interrogators, even on the stand in the trial, why Beverly? You didn't know her. So why, how did you select her? And it always came back to two things. It came back to the perception of wealth because she was a broker and because she worked in an industry that they knew they could get her alone. And so I must tell you quickly, their plan was to kidnap this rich woman and hold her for ransom and get all of this vast amount of wealth uh, from my dad via ransom. Now, an important point to note, um, I wish I could stand here with a straight face and tell you that my, you know, and I know it's irrelevant to the story, but what's tough about my mom's story, I think, is that everything that they did, every decision they made to, to choose her to be the victim of their crime was based in their perception of her, not in reality. Yes, my mom had had, mom, you know, times, you know, our real estate is a roller coaster. My mom at times had had great success in the industry. At times, she was in the top 10 agents in the entire state of Arkansas. And uh, believe it or not, there are more than 10 agents in the state of Arkansas. Um, but there were also times that were slow. So I want to talk to you just quickly because I think this is an important point because this is what would apply to you as well if I were to just try to do a little bit of research about each of you on this, this Zoom today. Imagine, and this is what happened to my mom, that I go on you know, my laptop here as soon as we get off, I've made notes of all your names, and I begin doing Google searches to see what I can find out about you. And then as a next step, I go to your Facebook profile, whether that's your personal one, your business one, and I poke around just to see what I can tell about you and any wealth you might have or valuables that I want. And then lastly, which is what the, the bad guys as a third step did in my mom's case, is that they took her name online to um, our local county property records and searched to determine where she lived and the pro most importantly, the property value of the home that my mom lived in. And so based on all of this publicly available information, which quite frankly, doesn't really tell you much, they made the decision. And this was the, to, to, for my mom to be um, you know, their victim based on just those things. And they perceived her to be so wealthy, and this is their words, that they would get so much money that they would never have to work again. And again, you know, I, I, just because it's in the spirit of transparency and for you to understand there are no pretenses here. Um, and I'm sure, you know, back to things that my parents would appreciate me telling. But the day my mom was kidnapped, she had 150 bucks in her checking account. She had $50 in her pocket. So the point that I have, you know, utterly exhausted on this slide, I get fired up about it, is that 
And you all, you all have seen this in your own lives. I know you have, that you have people in your life because you are in real estate. You can only do one transaction a year. But just because you have that R behind your name, for certain people, there's this perception that real estate agents are so wildly successful. It's why we see, you know, the real estate schools full every weekend of people trying to get into the industry with the hopes of making this unlimited amount of wealth. So as I transition to the next slide, my precious sweet mom, she did not know this couple, but based on publicly available information, um, they set their sights on her to kidnap, to hold for ransom. And we all must remain so diligent that there would be people that could target any of our agents, any of us for those same reasons. And so today for the rest of the story, as I tell you this story, I'll identify ways that we can really work to keep this from happening again. This slide shows you the, this is the home that my mom was showing when she was kidnapped. You know, out of context, you know, we could have you know, put this slide, this visual on any of the, the presentations today. And, you know, it's just kind of run of the mill. We've got a, an exterior, you know, photo of a nice house. Hard to tell, but this is lakefront property. You've got the street address and property description. And you've got a, an appointment time. But I, I would like if you would just step through this with me again to put yourself in this position. Imagine today that you or agents that follow your leadership begin to get phone calls, text, and emails. So you've got three different medium of communication going from a husband and a wife. Their story is that they're moving to your local area, um, relocating due to work. They're already in your area and they are living in kind of a temporary housing situation they want to get out of it as soon as possible. Luckily, they are cash buyers, so hopefully that will move a little quicker. And they um, you, you know, just the emphasis of here's what we're looking for with you know this many bedrooms, this many bathrooms, so forth. You know, like we talk with all of our new clients about. Again, my mom is talking to both husband and wife. So, so far, so good. We have these, those, especially those of you with all, you know, years and years of experience. I, I've heard from so many agents that, you know, this is standard. But to peel back the layers of that, the names that have been given to my mom were fictitious. The only thing that, that had been, that my mom knew that she had been told was that this couple was married. That was true. But aside from that, the names were fictitious. They had taken those names and they had created email accounts. And that, you know, in effort to, of course, protect their true identity. They had also, as they interacted with my mom via the phone calls, text, they were using an app on their phone that provided them a spoof number. And I know, you know, so many of us now, you know, in 2014, we weren't as plagued by calls coming to our phone from local numbers. And, you know, so, you know, back then, if you were getting a local call, you could pretty much answer it. But now, really, a phone number, we all know, or goodness, I hope we do, you know, a phone number really means nothing in kind of identifying at least the location of the person on the other end of the phone. And to that point, the spoof number that they were using, the area code of that Num of that that phone number, it matched the area that they said they were moving from. And so, you know, it's purely, you know, kind of speculative if that was, if that in maybe in some way in my mom's mind, you know, kind of helped further who these people were and that they were telling the truth. You know, the last point too is that, um, well, I'll actually save that thought. And so, you know, my mom did like we all 
you know, we all do whenever we're working with new clients. Um, you know, so many things she did right, such as for every client, she, she had a very consistent process where she used a, what we call it, you know, call it a million different things, but a client profile sheet where you capture all their basic information, type properties they're looking for, and the contact information. And she had gone to the MLS and she had put in the parameters of the homes that they were looking for with these email addresses, not realizing everything, you know, she's typing in is all a lie. And in the fall of 2014, when this occurred, inventory was low. Um, it's almost hard to say that with a straight face now because obviously like way worse now than it was then, um, especially here. But my mom began to do like all of us are doing everywhere across the country right now is that you know we are within our own brokerages like guys please let me know the second you you know something that matches this criteria comes because i've got these these buyers and we've got to find something for them soon and you know moreover you know i always say and i'm sure you guys can relate to this god bless the people that are married to us because they have to hear every detail about every transaction we're working on whether they want to or not they're going to hear about it the woes of the day and um or the good news and so my dad was no exception and so to that point as my mom you know she did these great things in and capturing this basic information documenting it had she kept paper my mom was very good on paper so she had her big filing cabinets and she wrote everything down um had talked to a lot of other agents about what she was working on. They were very familiar with this couple and then also my dad. So then imagine when my mom went missing, that there were all these touch points of people that knew that my mom had been working with this couple from out of state. And so as mom, you know, continued down this path of trying to find them something, they, there really was no house on the market that they were interested in. They were being picky, which is totally fine. Um, but then kind of out of the blue, you know, my mom gets a request from the husband of this, these bad guys, and they wanted to see this house. And I think it's important to give you a little context about this specific property. One is that there is a comfortability with this neighborhood because this is the exact same community in which my parents lived. My parents lived on the same lake. Just a few doors down from this specific house is where the pastor of my mom's church lives. Um, and so, you know, who knows that, you know, I think sometimes our, our guard can go down when, when we're, you know, we're in our stomping grounds. We know how nothing ever happens in our sweet little communities. But alternatively, this specific house um, this is some excellent trick photography because this house actually wasn't in this great shape. It was very poorly represented online. Uh, this was a leading photo, and then there were only just a couple of other really dark photos. This property was foreclosed upon many, many years ago, and so it, is really just, it had fallen into a state of disrepair, and there had been issues of squatters. There had been issues of uh, vandalism. People had gotten here and stolen anything they could steal, even down to copper wiring. And so my mom also knew that. So not only is this her community in which she lived, but she also knew that this house, it... Um, and I know this from, you know, my parents living on the lake, we would be, I, I just kind of grew up seeing the back side of this house from the, the vantage point of the lake. And this house always seemed like such a shame that, it, you know, in its prime, it was probably a gorgeous property. So knowing both of those things, imagine then what happened whenever my mom got the call from the husband. And he said, we would like to see this property. Now, we only know how this call went from the vantage point of the bad guy. He told the interrogators about how my mom responded to him. And so we know from him that when he called to ask to see this property, that my mom told him that she apologized. And she said, hey, so sorry, but I'm not going to be able to show you that property because of a company policy that prohibits me from showing property alone. Now, there was no company policy, and um, 
you know, perhaps we should rewind and get the attorney back on. But, um, you know, I will say that, um, you know, so many brokerages around the country, especially talking to brokers about this, and they say, hey, you know, while we may not have a policy on, if we, if, a, if an agent wants to cite a policy just to uh, help overcome safety objections to keep themselves safe, by all means. And that's exactly what my mom did. There was no policy in effect about showing property alone, but she sure made it up. And, you know, I think it's so easy for us all to be like, you know, this, you know, this John Wayne rugged type, like I, I can handle myself. I'm on good. I can handle objections. And then suddenly you find yourself in a tight spot and you're at a loss for words. And so, uh, but we do know that my mom, for whatever reason, maybe it was her God-given instinct that something didn't quite set right with this guy. Maybe she just didn't want to show this property because she knew it would be a waste of time. But here's the turning point. The husband hands the phone to his wife and the wife says, and, um, hey, Beverly, I will be, I'm going to be coming straight from work. If would your company be okay if the three of us all meet there at the same time? And this particular part, well, for so many reasons, I wish we were all in the same room together right now. But this point of the story is one of the most powerful points when we're all in a room together, especially just, you know, just sales associates such as myself. Because what we do is that when I say that the, the wife said she would be there, not only was that a party of three, but also for many of us, and it's, it's not necessarily right, but I think a lot of us can identify with this. We do not, not the collective we, but just the we that fall into this, this mindset, associate violent crime or the potential of violent crime with women. If the wife is involved, many people and many agents across the country have said, I would have made the same decisions that your mom made because I would have trusted because the wife was in there that this uh, involved, this was a safe scenario. That be what it may. My mom agreed to set the appointment at 6 p.m. She told them that it was important that everyone get there by six because she, the days were getting shorter. She wanted them to be able to see the house in the daylight. There were no utilities at this property, so it was all the more important to see it in the daylight. An important point about this, and this is what I try so hard to impart, you know, so many of the, the preventive safety measures that we can talk to about agents, right, is the verification of identity, verification of funds. Um, and then as, you know, next steps, we can do, you know, pre-showing buyer consultations, or if you're going to a seller, you know, um, a listing presentation, taking someone else, um, you know, even if they're posed as your assistant, uh, just to be another body there. Um, but as I think those things, because we, those of us that have been in the business long enough, we hear them so often that in a safety presentation, it's kind of like someone saying, hey, just trust your gut. And then you get in a situation and it's almost you dismiss it because it seems so basic. Yet we get in a hurry. We're all going crazy lately trying to get things done. And I can promise you, it has been my experience, and I, I, would, I would assume that many of you would agree with this, that if we were to call, well, and I won't even answer this for you. This is something you can just answer for yourself. If we were to call 100 agents right now, and we were pretending to be a buyer sitting outside a house, and we wanted to see that house right now, and we at least had enough knowledge to say, no, I'm not working with another agent. How many of those 100 agents would just jump in the car and go? It's something to think about. Now, do I have to acknowledge that this is a largely safe industry? Absolutely. But also I know what can happen. And so this day, the day comes, it's uh, Thursday, September 25th. And my mom had, you know, I could say, you know, before COVID, I was able to tell everybody, my mom had a typical day in real estate. 
She worked a few hours in the office. We don't really know what that's like so much anymore. She then went to an affiliate luncheon and got her belly full of affiliates. You know, God bless the affiliates. I can't wait till we can get back to getting fed by them. <laughs> um, and then, you know, they, they have this themed lunch. Mom won 50 bucks that I told her she had in her pocket and um, went back to the office. And she, at one point, touched base with other agents again about this couple. And then she also called my dad. And she told my dad that what the rest of her day looked like and that she would on her way home be showing this house. And remember that this was in their community. So my dad knew exactly where this house was. And she told him that she was excited that she had won that, that raffle money. And she said, you know what, after I have uh, show this house, I'm going to stop by her favorite um, Mexican restaurant. And I'll pick up food and it was, and you know, I'll see you at home. It was a Thursday, like so many Thursdays before. If you think about, you know, the, those of you that have been in the industry for a long time, you know, my mom had been in the business for about a dozen years. She was a broker for her office. She was a real estate instructor. She taught pre licensure classes. Over the, her, the span of her career, she had the opportunity, which she loved and took so serious, to serve hundreds of clients. And throughout that tenure, undoubtedly showed thousands of properties. But all it took was one. And so my precious mom, um, she arrived at this house early, just another good safety tip for all realtors. And, um, you know, we could we could speculate, um, but we certainly didn't know for ourselves what we would do for houses like this, where there had been previous vacant, previous issues of squatters to to really proceed with, you know, assessing these properties as carefully as we can. We know that prior to to the appointment time that my mom had opened the house, but at six p.m., a black car pulls into the driveway next to my mom. And a young Caucasian male with short, dark hair got out of the car and approached my mom. And so what we learned is that around the same time that this, this man is approaching my mom, she is also receiving text from his wife. And they both, he has the in-person story and she has the text story and they both are the same thing. And they are that the story is that the wife has gotten caught up at work and she's not going to be able to make it to the show. And so if you're like me, every time I say those words, just, oh, you just, they just put her in the most awkward of positions. And then to further it. Because this house was so poorly represented online, and, you know, I don't think, we don't hear a lot of talk about the role of safety in real estate photography, but because this was so poorly represented online, this gave this couple a, a reason, an excuse to ask my mom if she would be so kind to proceed with showing this property, and, and if she would, as she walked through the house, take photos with her phone, and text them to the wife and be available to answer any questions that the wife may have. And, you know, in doing that, it would be as though she was uh, there with them, at least digitally. And so my, my sweet, precious mom, um, I so wish you all could have known, known her. Um, she had a difficult decision to make. The house is right there. Someone's standing right in front of her. She's got the wife texting her. And so my, my, my sweet mom, she agreed to do just that. And so as she walked through this house, taking photos and texting them to the wife, um, she had no idea that while she was taking those photos, and I'll tell you, after the trial, we got my mom's phone back. It was found in the home of these bad people. And 
you could see the last 10 photos of my mom's camera roll or of the interior of this house. She was almost just kind of room by room documenting the last moments until she got to the photo that you see on the bottom right of your screen. It was right as it's guessed, it was in this room that after taking this photo that the, uh, the bad guy, um, he surprised my mom from behind while she was taking a picture. And uh, he had a taser in her side. He's been very proud to admit that the last words that my mom heard in her freedom uh, was that she was about to have a very bad day. And he tased my, my precious mom. And he had the most ridiculous lime green duct tape. And uh, he uh, bound my mom with that tape and he put it over her eyes and over her mouth. He then came back outside this house and he got in his uh, car. He turned it around and backed it up to the front door of this house and he opened the trunk. I tell you those details because I think that it's, there's another safety message in this. And this is one of the biggest things I impart to, this is something you can share at the dinner table tonight because it's not just specific to real estate. And that is the importance of reporting suspicious behavior in the moment. Everything that I've told you about Six o'clock, black car, young Caucasian male, approaches my mom, moments later comes back out of the house, turns his car around, opens the trunk. It's those, um, those details, every bit of that, that's not speculation. Every bit of that was witnessed firsthand by the neighbor right across the street. But it wasn't reported, it wasn't uh, made known to the authorities until much later that night, whenever the authorities were door knocking, asking if anyone had seen anything because there was a local realtor that had gone missing. Um, this particular slide is, is very bothersome to me, but, um, you know, it before this happened to my mom, I could watch true crime shows or I could watch, you know, CSI and you see actors uh, being placed in the trunk of a car, but it's a very different thing uh, when you know your mom was. Uh, I think all the guys on the, on this this uh, Zoom with us today can, can vouch for the fact that there is a, a very special bond between a mother and a son. And uh, we take care of our moms. We love our moms. And uh, it, it's just, it's hard to, to grasp that this is even within someone to do this. And to make it even more disturbing, before he closed the lid of his trunk, he uh, pulled out his cell phone and he took a picture of my mom in the trunk of that car. And he did that. Uh, the authorities, the detectives, um, you know, presume he did that to show his his wife that their master plan was in play and so he closed the lid of that trunk and he drove away quick safety thing that i bet you already know all you ladies today so many ladies i mean it's just by and large whenever i talk to ladies about how what what what's your protocol for your purse when you're showing problems Ladies have protocol. If they, um, you know, are carrying some sort of protective um, device or, you know, firearm or whatever, then it may be that they, they keep that purse with them. Others have a very specific, consistent process of leaving it locked in the car. And that was my mom's process. And so that day, locked in her car, we found my mom's purse. In the passenger seat, we found that paper file that she had created for this couple, which in essence, when the detectives, investigators realized whenever they were able to connect the lies with the truth, my mom, so much of what she had done, although it wasn't enough to save her life, 
it was enough to help us find her. And it was enough to convict these awful people and get them to prison. An important point about how this couple had planned to get this ransom money. So they, they, their plan was to have my mom do videos. They were going to film my mom and my mom in her own words would be telling my dad what to do, how to get the money to these people. And they had this plan that they thought was so smart. The plan was to have my dad push all this wealth to accounts that were accessible via the cards in my mom's purse. So you may be realizing the issue now. In his haste to kidnap her and put her in the trunk of that car and drive away, he drove away that day without the very thing that he needed the most in order based on his plan to access the money. He left the purse behind. So, um, many hours later, of course, that appointment was at six, at eight, uh, about 8.30, I started hearing from my dad. My dad was concerned that my mom wasn't replying to phone calls or texts. And I encouraged my dad to go over to the house that mom said she was showing. I told him, this is totally fine. This is real estate running. You know, she's writing a contract, dude, where they brought in other family members to do a second one. You know, something. This, this has, you know, this can be explained. And so we end up, you know, dad finds, of course, my mom's car there on this, this large, you know, lot, plot of land right on the lake. No utilities, pitch black, but sitting there in the middle of the driveway. It's my mom's vehicle. And after he got the spare key and accessed the car, then we found my mom's belongings. And so then began this, these, this process of us trying to, none of us, except for my mom at this time, were in real estate. So, but we were trying to put our real estate hat on based upon what we knew about real estate from my mom. What scenarios make her just disappear? We knew it didn't make sense for her to get in the car with a client for safety or just professionalism. She would always have them get in with her if there was going to be that. And then why would she leave without her purse? But yet we still try to make, you don't want to accept, right? You want to just claim the hope that this all has an explanation. The later it got, more and more law enforcement arrived on the scene. And, you know, the neighborhood is just kind of lit up in just all these shades of blue from the flashing of the light. We had no idea that that night in this rural part of Arkansas, right outside of Little Rock, that after, after taking my mom and making my mom do the first video of that ransom, and then he took my mom to where they live, the bad guy's house, and they locked my mom in, in their master bathroom. And her owner's bathroom, I guess we say now. Um, and they... Then it becomes this, the, the realization that they didn't have the purse. And so he decides to go back and get the purse. So he left his wife with a firearm guarding the door of that bathroom to keep my mom from. And then more from that, um, you know, he actually, when he arrived on the scene that night, of course, we didn't know he was there. The cops didn't know he was the bad guy. They stopped him. They questioned him about the disappearance of my mom. He denied knowing anything and fled the scene. Speaking to what we didn't know then, moments later, my dad begins getting texts from my mom. And so if you think about this time, difference here. We're talking six hours and 21 minutes after the start of that showing. And my dad begins to get these. And so in that moment, when these spurts started coming in, we were so relieved, so excited. Um, I was a little bit embarrassed for her because I was like, oh my gosh, mom, there are so many cops involved. I mean, you got some explaining to do, sister. Um, and then that third text that you see there rolled in. 
And I know you all didn't know my mom, but he was, um, she loved my dad fiercely. She would never been out without him. And um, she wasn't much of a drinker. And um, which is odd in real estate. <laughs> but um, so we knew the second this came through that um, that third text came in. We knew that my mom had been taken. And what really kind of compounded our fear is that not only was this person so bold as to take my mom, they were also so bold to pretend to be her. Of course, we later find out that that the bad guy, as he was, you know, fleeing the scene, that he had turned my mom's phone on and began these texts to buy himself some time, throw things off. He gets back to his home and he he and his wife begin to freak out because how could people have known where my mom was showing property? How how is this? How does this make sense? And so they began their panic. Meanwhile, we had no idea what was going on. This is the entire time that my mom was missing. It's thought that my mom was um, killed not long after their panic. Uh, so in the early morning hours of, of September 26th, um, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, it's any stretch for you to imagine the horror these these days um, brought. But something that I really want to emphasize is the power of our realtor community. Um, when we need to come together, the 1.4, it's almost 1.5 million of us now, um, we come together in a mighty way. We had realtors, all of our local realtors were filling these soybean fields out by where my parents live, searching for my mom. Realtors flew in from other states, and of course, the outpouring of love um, and support, even to this day. I will always believe that it was the pressure from the real estate community, and by community, I mean, you know, the, all of us. It was that pressure that kept the heat on finding her, and then it kept the pressure on there being justice for her. And then I hope with you all, and what we continue to do, is that we we honor her and the other, our other, you know, family and, and realtor family that have been victimized, and we help make this industry safer. But to to just the point of this time, um, our family was so loved on by the real estate community. It was realtors that arrived on my doorstep at 4 a.m. on Tuesday, September 30th, tell me that my mom had been found. And they had found out from social media, you know, it, it got on social media that mom had been found even before the family was told. And so they wanted me to hear from them. It's so selfless. It must have been so hard for them to deliver that news. This um, is another photo from my mom's um, 50th birthday party. And something that I just, I want to hit on just three things quickly. And um, now I'll begin, you know, um, telling you the end and, and the key takeaways from mom's story. But in that ransom recording that my mom was made to do that video, um, it was never delivered to my dad, but it was later played during the interrogation process. And, you know, it was what you might expect. It was a video saying, don't call the cops in this type of thing. But I think most importantly, and you have to consider the context of all this, he had been tased and put in the trunk of a car and the fear that she must have been feeling. But she ended that ransom video with, uh, by saying these words to my dad. I just want you to know I love you very much. And I, I just, I remain so inspired by my mom and her heart and her love, even in this horrific time. She was uh, concerned with my dad, knowing how loved he was. Two other things, because, you know, we can only kind of speculate for the most part what this, how my mom responded, what it would be like. But we also know that evidence was found in the trunk of that car that my mom got her hands free 
And so my mom was fighting. And then lastly, and uh, the wife testified in the trial that as she stood outside um, that bathroom door guarding with a firearm to keep my mom from escaping, she said, although she never interacted with my mom, she had to stand there that whole time with that firearm, listening to the sounds of my mother's prayers. And so, you know, my mom loved so fiercely, fought for her, for her life. And then uh, probably most importantly, right until the very end, my mom clung to her faith. This is the spot where, um, where my sweet mom's life was ended. This is where these bad people buried her in a shallow grave. Uh, you see, once they got home, he got home that night and realized he couldn't get the purse. In complete shock that people knew where to start looking for my mom. And then also, as we hear in so many other stories about crime like this, the bad guys think they have the best, the brightest idea. They won't get caught, but they see blue lights. And it's suddenly an, an awareness is, you know, kind of awakened that they are going to get caught and they don't want to go back to prison. And so they panicked and they um, decided to just take everything that they could of value that my mom had on her person. They took my mom's jewelry. The wife even liked the shirt that my mom was wearing. And it was later found hanging in the wife's closet. Just disgusting as that sounds. But through the work, even though we lost my mom, it was through the work of 26 incredible investigators, my mom was found and I will always be in awe of how they found her. And they also were able to define the bad people that did this. They were able to trace back through that spoof number to the correct you know, identities. They were able to, to get these people to trial. And there was uh, the wife in exchange for her testimony against her husband. She um, is, in a 30 year sentence with the possibility of parole after she had served 21 years. The husband, thankfully, is in prison uh, forever. He's in prison for two life sentences, uh, no possibility of parole for capital murder and for kidnapping. I know this is an emotional, hard story to hear. And, um, you know, you're coming to a leadership summit to get inspired and kicked off and keep, but it's, it's so hard to hear. It's so uncomfortable, but it's so important. And so from mom's mom's story, please be reminded. And these are the things that we can impart to those that follow our leadership is that bad guys fit no definable profile. You know, we treat everyone the same. We screen everyone the exact same. We insist upon an in-person pre-buyer consultation in a public place or at a minimum, the exchange, electronic exchange of identification and do, a, do like we're doing right now. Just have a Zoom session, see each other's face, share the information with trusted colleagues in your office, obtain ID, use the internet to research your new clients like, like my mom uh, was, was sought out. Uh, have your itinerary and your location shared. Use technology for it. You know, we've got these incredible computers that, you know, we use as phones. And um, I have a very tight circle of family and friends that I always enable my GPS location. And um, I have a, a colleague that I share my, my work email. Um, and so our work calendar. And I hope you'll think of my mom and that, that burning feeling that we know she probably at least felt standing outside that house that day to talk to her all given instincts. Um, and then, of course, with my mom being taken from by surprise, uh, keep our clients in front of us. And then, of course, as we learned from the next door neighbor observing the suspicion, the reporting it to the authorities immediately.
So as the next step, as I close, um, I hope that you will keep the conversation going um, to let you know about resources so that you can make a positive difference. We have the Beverly Carter Foundation now, that, of course, that um, is a legacy for my sweet mom. And um, we it's a nonprofit and we solely just work on safety awareness, education, and uh, victim assistance. Uh, unfortunately, we continue to see agents victimized and uh, we, we work hard, entirely volunteer organization. The CE shop, and you can see this, the, the URL there, it's a part down within it. Um, that is a free site of resources. And then if you haven't been on NAR safety site in a while, um, they actually just before NAR annual in November, they did a complete revamp. It is so good. Um, I did not like it before. I found it messy and hard to navigate. Now it's gorgeous, amazing resources. I hope that you'll check it out because I'm here to tell you good, good, good stuff. This is the last slide um, I'll share. And it's, it's my three kids and um, a sign for sale sign of my mom's. I've photoshopped it a bit to take that brokerage off. But um, this photo was taken one week to the day um, before my mom was taken from us. We were out running the neighborhood and we stopped with, uh, we called our mom all. So we stopped by one of mom all's listings and took this picture and posted it on her Facebook wall. Of course, she loved it. And if I may, just to make this, uh, this photo uh, symbolic of you um, and your life. If you think about that, that for sale sign being your commitment to this industry, your commitment to your role as a leader and realizing how significant your actions, your behaviors, what you do shapes how those that follow you act. I just hope that my mom's story, that, you know, my words in some small way have, have impacted you to where you will be ever more mindful of the people on the periphery of your role, of your responsibility, of those that follow you, your family members, your loved ones that stand around you, that love you, adore you. And um, I, I hope you will be ever more mindful of how, how much you are needed and valued and um, how we need to get you and everyone that follows you home safely each and every day. My contact info is there on the slide. Please feel free to reach out at any time. I'm always happy to help. Um, I cannot thank you enough for this tremendous opportunity. Um, thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Idaho Realtors. God bless you all. Carl, this is Cindy. I just cannot thank you enough for the courage that you've displayed in sharing this story. Um, I think I speak for everybody in saying that we are so, so sorry for your loss. Our hearts go out to you. Um, the work you're doing is tremendous, and and once again, please let please know that you're held in our prayers um, and in our thoughts. And the, just the story is just so moving. Um, if anything can come out of this, I certainly hope that the message that you shared with us today can continue to be shared. And it can prevent this from happening to another realtor. So, Carl, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you so much. Stay safe, everyone.